yeah, without further ado, over to you, Johnny. Fantastic, Frank. What a uh, what a, what a build up. No, nothing, no expectation there at all. So that's that's okay. always good. <laughs> Manage expectations, Frank, as always. Um, real real real, um, real privilege to be here and uh, whether it's like this or in person um, the one thing we always want to focus on is the is the wines and you everyone who's going to be drinking them and, and enjoying them and that's really we're just here to sort of to, to help, help it all come together um, anyone who's ever been to a, with any wine tasting um, if it's with me or with anyone about for Casa Silver, there's a real, um, you'll find a real, a real style to it. Um, and as I said, it, I'm just in the background. Everything really is about what comes from behind me here in the one of this is the Paradona's estate behind me, uh, where one of the wines we're going to be tasting comes from. And uh, it, it's all about the grapes. Um, first and foremost, just so we, so we set that, lay that out on, on the line now, everything about these wines, what makes them great. If, they, if you think they're great, that's up to you. Uh, but it's all about really about, about the farming. Um, and hopefully we're going to be joined by, by somebody in a little bit who can uh, give us a bit more um, in, uh, sort of insight into that. Uh, but what, what do we, I'll give a very quick sort of intro to Casa Silva. We've got the wine with us, so we can all probably have a little taste before we sort of start officially tasting it and um, and then pretend we haven't tasted it when we officially taste it. So do do carry on and drink it. Don't don't uh, don't worry. But I won't be peeking on that, so don't worry. Um, but the, the estate itself, um, as Frank said, I, I've been working with them for nearly 20 years, and uh, that's just a small part of their part of their very long history. And what's been so exciting, I think anyone who's who's been with the wines, seen the family. Um, it, it's just the constant evolution, the learning, the pushing, the, under, the wanting to understand what is going on in, in the Colchagua Valley. And part of the reason we, we, they've done this, the family do this, and why, why we talk about these wines is that we see Chile um, as almost quite often as, an, as a sort of one entity. You know, you have your Chile in white, you have your Chile in red, very often it's Sauvignon Blanc, very often it's Merlot, thank you, Frank, goodness me. And as you can see, a wide uh, range of different environments from the very dry deserts, the largest ocean, the, the highest mountain, the longest mountain range. So, you know, it's got unbelievable um, uh, geographical uh, characters uh, and features. Um, and if you think about this country, it's five, Four or five thousand miles long, about 120, 130 kilometers wide, um, and just with all these giant uh, features around them, the the the, the range of, uh, of environments, of weather, of soils, of topography is just incredible. So we just want to just give you a little glimpse into this one valley, the Colchagua Valley, um, but then get you thinking on this about Chile in general. I think, well, hang on, there's the Colchagua Valley, and then there's all the entire world in this one valley. Then there's all the other valleys, north and south. You know, I'm going to have a slight so leaning towards Casa Silva, obviously, but I very much have the idea to get everyone out into Chile to really experiment and see what it, what it can do. Um, and if that is just by having a look at this little one glimpse, what I can show you here to maybe whet the appetite, the amount you will find that is unbelievable. So break away from this, the, the straightforward, the entry level, first thing you see in a pub or a restaurant is the, is the house wine. There's so much going on there. Even with Sauvignon Blanc, we can, uh, we can really, uh, really, really get very excited indeed. But a brief history of the, of the Silver family and the, the estate. Um, as a lot of, I suppose, a lot of the estates we see now in, in Chile, they were really sort of, the, the, the process really started towards the end of the 19th century. There had been vines back in the sort of the sort of 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, grapes were grown um, very much for religious reasons for producing wine or also it was said, um, but just very, very much, they were, they were functional, functional grapes and functional wines. The, what we see now really started at the end of the 19th century when a lot of Europeans left Europe, chased out by phylloxera, that, that devilish little, uh, nematode uh, which destroys the rootstocks um, and prevents the, the and, and the leaf canopy as well and really just renders the vines um, un, unproductive after about five or six years so they thought right sacre bleu enough zut alors, as we'd say uh, and they, they headed off with their with their vines with a cabernet with a merlot with a cabernet franc with a petit verdot with a carmenere sauvignon semillon all these grapes and went down to south america um, it's a bit simplified, obviously. Um, but what they found there was this incredible, uh, certain places they landed, found this incredible climate. It's very, very sunny, very dry, not too hot. Um, the ability to cool down at night. There's, there's something very, very special. And Emil Bouachon, who was the, the, the initial founder of Casa Silva, uh, who came over in 1892 from Saint Emilion. Um, this always sounds a cliche when I say it, so please excuse me, but it's true. Um, even in those days, uh, the, the early silvers, five generations ago, were looking for something a little bit different, saying, yes, the land around Santiago is fine. It's brilliant, the good soil, the good climate, everything is great. 
but I think there's a bit more here. So even then he headed down, down to the Colchagua Valley, which is about 100 and, about 120, 130 kilometers south of, of Santiago. Um, and and basically thought, wow, this is incredible. Whether it was the, the amazing fluctuation from, from daytime to nighttime temperature, the, the certain features in the Andes Mountains um, that he was seeing. Um, obviously the main winery was in Angostura. If you have your little map in front of you, the of the four, no pressure, Frank. Um, there's another. There's a. You may. There's another map with it with the four different estates of spanning the Colchagua Valley, um, and the original one was in. Um, oh, Angra, yeah. good it was Angostura. <laughs> Before anyone asks, Angostura just means a, a narrow place where the coastal range and the Andean range are coming together. So Angostura is all over all over Chile, um, and it just means it's a narrow place, and it's it's not the not the bitters, not those things that sit in our drinks cabinet, as they have done for many years. And we wonder what they are, um, and which I think come from. Barbados, or apparently originally, I learned they, they originally came from Venezuela. So there you go. That's something you learn at these sort of things. But yeah, Angostura, the original site where Emil Bouchon um, really, really first started. And we, we would go on 20 years, probably to about 1912, when the first major vineyards were planted here and the winery was built. And there are still vineyards there that go, go back to that time. So we see um, there's some really amazing understanding and culture um, of, of the grapes. And that's really the key of, of making the the good understanding the vines and, and making the, the, the best fruit. It's year after year of studying the vines and understanding and asking why, why does that happen? Um, and ever since I've known them, they've never ever stopped questioning the uh, you know, what 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 is, what is happening. As we can see from the from the map here, um, Angostura is would be de would be defined as an Andean property. It's in the sort of the, the Andean sector of the, of Chile. You have then the central one, the Entre Cordillera, um, where we don't have any vineyards. Um, it's a bit nice and easy in there. It's a bit flatter. You know, if you want, it, it's a bit easier to grow vineyards. I think the silver's always liked a bit of a challenge. Um, like anything in life, the bit the harder it is potentially the greater reward. Um, the, the more difficult it is to do something, you will tend to get a little bit more out, out, out of it, whether it's putting the vine on a bit more stress, it's finding the, so the right soils, the right topography, the right temperatures, the right everything. Um, but again, we don't know that until you, you try. It's trial and error. Everything is trial and error. You make mistakes, you learn, you don't do it again, you try something different. But you can see as we go down the valley from Angostura to Lolol, um, planted in 1997, 98, um, and then down to Paradones, where we're tasting the first wine from, which was planted in, in 2000, about 2006. Um, and at the time, each of these estates, Lolol, Angostura, uh, Paradones, um, and Los Lingas up in the Andes, they were the first time there were grapes planted there. I think at any, uh, if, you, if you went back 25 years, you would just find sheep and scrub and not, and not very good land. Um, but the Silvers sort of saw something there in, in each of these places. And we'll talk a little bit about each one as we taste the wine from there. But roll on 70, 80 years, um, quite a bit of socio, socio Political history happened. Chile went left and right, and things got lost and refound. And it was about in the, the early nineties that uh, Mary, Mario Silva Cifuentes uh, really decided to bring the the, the old property back together, um, and so really started to to to, to bring in the the old estate and started to make to really focus on their own wines. And in about ninety eight, they then started up the brand Casa Silva to reflect their own family. Whereas they'd already, already been making wines for many, many years, it would, like many producers, smaller producers in, in Chile had been sold on to the larger exporters. Now was the big, the big revolution at the end of the 90s when they thought, right, these are pretty exciting. We're gonna, get, we're gonna take, put our name on these and take them out to the world, but with our identity and with our, our, our really strong character here. Um, and I sort of picked them up two, two or three years later and it's been just, just a roller coaster. Um, but I think the best thing to do really first is, uh, is, is officially taste, taste a wine and raise a glass. Mine obviously looks a bit strange against my back, background. It looks a bit spectral. Um, so I don't get a lot, you won't see a lot out of just looking, looking at the wine. Um, if we're all veterans of, of many tastings, I never assume anything with a tasting. And I remember from all the ones I've been to, any any questions you fly, fire out, I will have asked already. Um, there is no silly question in wine tastings. There is no right or wrong in what you smell and what you taste. Just let it out, let it go. Um, and that's the, that's the best thing. It, it helps me actually, because I, I make a note of these and then I'll repeat them again. So uh, I'm, I'm guilty of plagiarism definitely, but I learn more from all of you then almost you can learn from me in a way. So uh, keep 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 it coming. Um, but we we will start here with the uh, with, with the Sauvignon Blanc, the Coco Sauvignon Blanc from Paradones. Um, as I said, planted in 97, 98. Um, at the time it was planted, there was there was nothing there at all. Just a bit of simple farmland, uh, you know, the sheep, a little bit of agriculture, farmers farming just to feed themselves, and year to year it was very very simple. Um, 
we are about as close as you can get to the ocean, I think, and actually still produce healthy vines. Um, you go to the other side of the coastal range, you'll be very hit by the, the winds uh, from the ocean and the, and the, and the very dramatic sort of fluctuations in, uh, in the weather. But here, it's, it's really noticeably, tangibly, it's quite a raw and rough place. The water levels are very, very low, very dry, very arid. The, the temperatures um, are significantly cooler than the rest of the valley. We're looking at, you know, 23, 24, maximum 25 degrees in the summer. So that's, you know, for Chile is really, very, very cool indeed. It's very dry. The water you can see there is only a reservoir that is captured, rainwater captured. There is no other water to have. So it's this combination of, it's a real balance in nature. Um, and, and really the, the really whatever, really when we talk about sustainability, it's the buzzword, it's a tick boxing, but there's a real understanding of what it means here with the silver family. Um, and it basically means the vines have to sit within the environment, the vineyards have to sit within the environment and know that they're going to be there in 5, 10, 15, 20 years time. You take too much out of it, they won't be there. Um, and that's what you've got to try and work out. And it's very interesting, um, the, 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 met the methods and techniques and hopefully when, if, if Rene, do you know if Rene has joined us yet, Frank? Yes, he is there, yeah. Fantastic. Well, he can tell us um, a little bit about the, the, the estate of Paradonis in, in terms of the sustainability and why it's very special, why it's very, uh, just, it's unique. Um, and as, as a viticulturalist, um, I, I've, I've never met anybody quite so, uh, the understanding of the vines and working with a family. And I think you'll get a sense of that from them. But Rennie, just a, little, a few words on Paradonis and about you and, uh, and just why this, this wine is so special. And then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll taste it officially. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, Rennie. Is he, is he, is he on mute? He's there. Still on mute. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Oh, oh Rene. <laughs> actually, Rene, Rene, you said it better when you were mute, on mute, actually. So could you go back? <laughs> I know that uh, you, you don't uh, read the lips. That's uh, in, in my job, you need to, uh, to read the lips. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more, more or less the same. Uh, it's an honor to talk about the Paredones. Paredones is a relative uh, new uh, DO, new area in uh, in Chile. And uh, Paredones won his, his site in, actually in, in, in the long term um, varieties like uh, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, or Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, see as well. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is uh, when you're talking about the, uh, the one of the the elements who compound the, the 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 word is the soil. The first thing we are placed or located in the, in the area of Paradones, which is a very distinguished area for the kind of rocks that uh, we have uh, there. The first thing is uh, we call it like uh, batholith. It's a really tricky name, Batholit. Uh, it uh, means when you have a volcano eruption, you have two ways uh, how the, the magma moves. When it's the, the normal explosion, you, you can see the fire and uh, all the, the rocks and the, the magma running down uh, from the volcano. And the other is the same magma goes into the ground and, and appears in certain places between the fourth to the eighth region. And uh, the, the, the magma appears and uh, quickly, really quickly, uh, goes uh, cold. The main issue is when you, when you, when you, something like this process happen, the, the first thing is that all the, the rocks are big and mainly, in that case, it's quartz, schist, and mica. This is the, the principal rocks who compound uh, paredones. In the other hand, that means we have a natural low fertility in, in, in our soils. The second thing is the weather. When we decide to uh, uh, planting in paredones, the first thing that we know is, OK, we are in, a, in, a, um, in the edge of the Colchagua Valley, May, uh, we are really close to the, the uh, Pacific Ocean. It's around six to seven kilometers. It's really, really close. That means, obviously, we, we, we expect 
uh, foggy mornings, uh, a, a, a low ratio of uh, radiation, uh, lower uh, hours of sun because you're close to the to the, the ocean. The temperatures and the thermal amplitude are totally different again. And when you have all those elements, you you decide which is the, the way that we 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 managing the those this uh, property. That means the first thing is the 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 yields. Uh, it, we don't want any records of yields in in Paredones because it's a it's, it's an area who produce quality uh, for, uh, over the, the the quantity, and uh, we decide to improve the natural characteristics of uh, Paredones in order to represent clearly the, the terroir. And when you taste the the Sauvignon Blanc, we expect you find some something salty or mineral. Uh, that is the the the, the is a, a good conception of what happened uh, during all the time when you are uh, in the uh, all the time that from bad break to harvest uh, is the sea influence. This that's that's mineral or salty notes. The second thing is the acidity. Our problem in, in Paredones is not uh, to, to have acidity. The problem is how we burn <laughs> with the sun exposure from, uh, of the clusters, how we decrease that acidity in order to make more palatable wines. This is the, the, was in the beginning the main issue. We produce really nice Sauvignon Blancs with, with, with acidity uh, sometimes a, a really, really, really uh, low pH or, or high acidity means uh, or, or makes the wines sometimes undrinkable. Uh, that that what ha happened in the in the first uh, years. After that, we learn more about uh, the the climate and how to improve the ripeness in, in in our varieties, and and we start to handling totally different our vineyards. That's obviously. Uh, from the other places. If we uh, try to make some uh, uh, similitude between uh, uh, Paredones and another place, maybe the closer site that we have is uh, is Ranco. And it's, it's a very particular area. Today, from this, this area, we have the best Sauvignon uh, Blanc in Chile, another winery has the best uh, Rosé in Chile, or uh, in some cases there, uh, another uh, uh, winery has the, uh, the, the award of uh, the best Riesling. But for us, it's really good because it's from the, main, the, the, same, uh, the same area, maybe three or four kilometers uh, from our property. When uh, singularity, this is the, 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 the word that, uh, that I think every time that I, I, I'm, I'm thinking in, in Paredones. And the other thing is uh, uh, quality. Sustainability for us is really important and, and to keep uh, steady quality uh, year by year. That's, that's, our, that's our goal. And um, like I, I said yesterday, finally for us, uh, we have a conception of uh, of our wines. It's uh, tasty. Mm. We like to make tasty wines. That, that means we, we don't have any limitation in order of alcohol or or whatever. The idea is when you taste uh, the wine, it's, uh, you you say uh, it's, it's a tasty wine. It's, it's think, really nice. That's really what that's 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 exactly it. We can all get very lost in uh, how we how we talk about wines, uh, yields, and pyrazines, and alcohol, and acidity, all this this thing. But ultimately, yes, we can measure everything and we go back to it. But it's 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 what we think of the wines that come out. Um, and Rene, what I find it very exciting whenever I, whenever I speak to you, how many times I speak to you, it's that sense that everything you've done with this family in Paradones is really for the first time, and everything you have done 
people, other wineries come along and think this is exciting. I see things are being won here. Um, let's let's give this a go. And then suddenly you find, yes, we have the best Riesling, we have the best rosé, best rosé. But these are things that you have, you're sort of leading the way. And it's it's it's, it's the hardest it's the hardest job. You know, you get in wine. It's not like spirits, like gin, or you can do another batch if it's not very good. You get one one year. Um, and that I think is the, the the speciality of what you do, and the and with the family, it's that that questioning. You 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 see what, why is that part of that vineyard? What what is the acidity, acidity like there? What is the fruit style? What, why might that be? And it's that going back and questioning every single time, um, and, and trying to understand what what has happened, and then maybe changing it or keeping it the same. Um, because th this wine, I think when Rennie was talking about it, you know, we've all tasted it, and I think as soon as he mentioned the word sal saltiness. I think we were all going, there was a little not imperceptible nod from all of us going, oh, there is a little bit of sauciness. But what, what is also interesting um, is that sort of tight texture to the wine. There's a real, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, we, we very classically, you'd get big, ripe, super tropical, big gooseberry flavors all up front, and then they disappear. Um, this is a very, very different style. It's quite a powerful wine. We've talked about some buzzwords to uh you know the, the acidity in the wine but it's the it's the, the overall feel we always look at the balance and that will always come from what rene does in the in the vineyards it's the natural balance of the grapes um and we we try we, we take this wine up to the nose and it's much more it's you almost cannot get past that that mineral sort of green citrusy element to it it's, it's very powerful but it's not that explosive nose that slaps you around like many sauvignon blanc and then when you taste it as well we just taste it quickly now Oh, it's it's almost like you have a little plant in your mouth, like you have little leaves um, and the uh, salty leaves or a little bit of uh, a little cactus or something. Your tongue, your mouth, everything is coated with this lovely texture. And then you get these sort of salty, citrusy flavors. But again, any flavor we get, it's 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 very personal. Don't worry what I'm saying. It's mostly rubbish. Um, um, <clears throat> But just it's it's what what we feel in the mouth, and it's that lovely. You get that real lovely mouth watering acidity at the back. You don't notice it until I say it, because it is all there in the right amount. But yes, it is a good fresh acidity, so the pH is is nice and low. But it's in the balance of the wine, and that makes the wine that makes the wine tasty. If you like the style of, uh, of Sauvignon Blanc, but the importance is to show this style of wine. If we want a different type of Sauvignon, we may go to uh, La Lol or Angostura or another valley, another winery. Uh, but this is what is the, when we talk about the terroir, it's, it's René, it's the vines, it's the soil, it's everything. It's how they plant them. It's how they, how close together they plant the vines, how many grapes come from each vine. There are so many different things which will have an impact on this wine. And the key is to show this expression. Um, René won't like me saying this, but he's, uh, he's a little bit crazy, I think, um, in, a, in a nice way. I'm a little bit, we're all a little bit crazy. We have to be. But it's this freedom to, which is, I think, the, as, as the, the, the silvers, to, to have people that let's almost go a little bit wild in the vineyards. Um, yes. Say, so this is what we're doing. We're, we're not going to just make it okay. We're going to make it the best we can. Let it go. Let it run. Be wild. You know, we might catch René running through the vines with his clothes off to be as one with the vines, but that's the way we go. You know, that's just how it happens. Um, and would, it's very, uh, very, very, very important. Jeff, what I would say is you may not like the comparison, but it's probably the closest you can get to Sancerre in the new world, that, that mm. saline, salty, mineral element. It's, it's got all of that sort of flinty, wet stone characteristic. And uh, René, I was just wondering, are there any kind of cool climate grape varieties that you've experimented with that actually haven't worked with that uh, with that sort of Chilean climate? Is there anything that has stood out and worked particularly well other than just the Sauvignon Blanc, the Pinot Noir and the Syrah that you've been doing with the Cool Coast? Is there anything that's really worked and surprised you or anything that really hasn't worked? Normally, normally uh, when, when, we, when you make a Zoom, a Zoom in, in, in Paradones, the, the, the first thing that, that I, disc I discovered is that it's absolutely logical is that how many hectares of uh, Sauvignon Blanc we have. We have, we planted 49 hectares, 0.5. <laughs> and then we have uh, around 22 hectares of uh, Sauvignon Blanc. For me, when we just say that, you say, okay, I have a big, big, big rainbow with different colors. And uh, one of the things that we, we increase is the, the concept of uh, uh, like a tailor-made, you know? 
we have many many places and uh, we have some reds and blues and greens uh, the idea is to have uh, all the colors uh, in order to can blend these colors you know finally the, the pink color the red whatever is the the add of different micro plots who are working in a in a certain goal for us we don't want uh, uh, ex uh, it's over ripeness and in this case it's over green when you feel uh, grass and just grass uh, or maybe some chili green chili and that's it for for us it's not not our not our goal we we want to produce a really tasty good uh, sauvignon blanc with different uh, layers you know some uh, uh, some lime notes the the salty notes the greenness uh, the pires the pires makes uh, uh, his effect also. But for us, the, the most important thing is, if you ask me, the name of the block where you made the, the grapes for Cool Coast is 22 hectares in a small plots of a half of hectare. And finally, when you taste the grapes, say, OK, this is the moment for this block, uh, block or plot. Uh, this is a, like a, a patchwork, you know, that's it. You put different colors and you finally have your final piece. That is a, a lot of micro plots working for the final uh, product. It's, it's, it's the Sauvignon Blanc, obviously. And and, and also, René, do you, um, I think also what Frank would like to know, are there any other, you know, we've talked about Riesling and, and Rosé wines. What other grapes have you uh, tried, the you know, secret grapes that we haven't heard about? Um, that you're, you're you know, under under hidden away that you that you've tried that haven't worked and you've just made them disappear or is there anything else that you would like to see uh, what now you have a little bit more knowledge of this area only sort of twenty years maximum of this area what you would like to see or what you have tried but haven't haven't maybe pursued yeah 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 we 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 we, we have a uh, two very important decisions for like a. Uh, like a company. The first one is uh, Riesling. We, we make Riesling in the south of Chile, in Branco. For, uh, for us, uh, Riesling is placed in, in the south. But uh, today, we're working really hard with uh, the Chardonnay. Uh, it's a debt for us, you know? We are really concerned uh, all the day about the, the rainbow of Sauvignon Blanc, but uh, from uh, a year ago, we are start to work uh, really hard with the, the quality of Chardonnay. And uh, we, we try to, yeah. The new project is a, a few hectares of Tempranillo in, in this area. Interesting, interesting, very interesting indeed. I, I think you know, we, we've probably all tasted 40, 50, 60, or hundreds of Sauvignon Blancs from, from Chile in the last 10, 15 years, plus years. But I still don't think I ever taste one quite like this. Um, good or bad, I'm not, we're not saying it's the, the best or the worst or whatever, but it really has a style of its own. And it, I think it, it, it reassures us. Um, it gives us a glimpse of, of what, what can be done here. Um, as uh, Rene says, this is one part of Paradones, a, 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 a small part of which there are many, the 22 hectares, there are many different little bits of it still learning about that and just over another hill there will be another little bit um, no, which will do something else and it's absolutely. you know it's 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 really exciting and i think by by g going out to these places by trying these new things um as we say right down on the coast here um it's it's it just shows what can be done this is just a, just the beginning i think of of of, of, the, of the, the, the sort of the next or the third generation of chilean wines this this whole real unbelievable micro terroir approach to it um, and I think we're going to see more and more in the next few years. But you can see how close we are to the ocean here. Um, so you get that, you get that, as Rene said, those lovely cool, uh, the, the mist that come in, uh, the cool air which comes up from the Humboldt current, which is the deep water, which just comes up quickly. Um, and that just keeps it just, just keeps it very, very cool. And, you know, we talk about cool coast. You'll see every winery, cool this, cool that. Great. But. I, the one thing that at Castle and Rene will, will repeat this, that it's about how the wines taste. Um, we can talk about anything, the soil temperature, the depth, the rainfall, the tension, the stress, whatever. 
Um, but it's actually the effect, it's how you taste the wines is the mo single most important thing, not what you say it's going to be, it's what it is. Um, and that's what uh, Rene and Mario Gacy, the, 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 the chief winemaker and the Silver family, every year you just taste it. You, you, you don't presuppose anything, you don't assume anything, you wait and see. Um, and it's that open mindedness, that willingness to see what might happen, what might be different, that really, really is exciting um, and shows us what, what, what is possible. Um, Johnny, yes, just, Johnny. Just, just one example. This is really important. In, uh, according to you are talking about that, it's uh, the, defini the, the, the definition of the, the, the type of wine that we want to make. That is, uh, we, we don't have any de definition, definition uh, in, in this place. We, we start to, to do things. I remember. Uh, Five, six years ago, we start to, in the middle of the summer, to make a living in the Sauvignon Blanc because we want more ex uh, sun exposure of the bunches. Everyone <laughs> who look at the video said uh, they're crazy. They are totally crazy because the sun heat and the sunburn and the acidity. They, they don't know what, what is our reality. We have uh, enough acidity. And, and we try to regulate the, 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 the acidity in the grapes in order to don't make any correction in, in the winery. But never forget, you, 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 make, you need to make drinkable wines, make a satisfaction when you taste the, the wines. That's, that's our, our philosophy. And after that, if we can make something really distinguished, Okay, perfect. But normally, when you taste our grapes, our wines, are good wines. We don't want to be the best of best in town, but uh, we want to make a pleasure when you taste the wine. That's our idea. And and even more so, Rene. I think as we move on to uh, looking onto Los Lingas now, where we we have ten more years of of experience of of growing the vines. Um, and everything you talk about, the patchwork, suddenly the patchwork is even bigger. Your rainbow is made of many, many more colors. Um, and I think as we move on to the, uh, the, the Carmenere and the story, uh, and very, very briefly as we, as we head on to that, and we'll look at, at why it's been so, so exciting at Los Lengas, and, and again, why Rene and the, and the Silver family have been leading the way. Um, the, the Carmenere, just as we all might know, it was, was seen as the, 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 the lost grape of, of Chile. Um, you know, that's a nice romantic story. It's lovely. And in the early 1990s, it was found again. And oh, wow, now we understand why the Chilean wines are green because we're. Young money was to Yeah, exactly. We're, we're picking unripe Carmenere, but we didn't know it. And so everyone's happy. Oh, it's Carmenere. Um, this is going to take over. This is going to be Chile's Malbec, uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon. It's been everywhere. We're going to grow it everywhere. Um, uh, and I think what, uh, what, why this is so relevant, just to mention this now, is that when we get into Carmenere, we suddenly find that it wasn't that great variety. It is uh, one of the most difficult grape varieties to, to, to make well, not, because, not only because it's difficult to, to ripen well, but because the, the contrasting flavors, tannins, uh, elements of it are so different, even within a single vineyard. Um, and every little bit of research that the Silver family again have pioneered in the last 20 years into this grape have shown that you've really got to grow this in the right place. Yes, it's great to have a, a, a grape variety that is, is sort of it's not quite unique, but it's almost emblematic to, to Chile. But you cannot just grow it everywhere. It's not Cabernet Sauvignon. It's not Merlot. Um, you've got to find the right spot. And that's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> I talk too much. Uh, but going back, uh, when we, we take, take, just going back a few years into the early 2000s, when the, the Silvers were making these beautiful, beautiful Carmenere's, all these lovely ripe flavors. And it was very exciting, very beautiful wines. But they, would, they knew that there was this incredible variety within the, the estate of Los Lingas. Um, and it really make it, wanted them to understand they needed to observe what was happening. Um, and in Los Lingas, as in, I think in Lolol as well, they took five different grape varieties, um, divided the whole vineyard, vineyard up into these little plots, uh, grew the vines identically, made the wines identically for three consecutive years to see what different styles would happen just from different parcels of, 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 uh, of vineyard and yes there were differences in Carmenere and Syrah and Chardonnay um, and, and Merlot but it was the Carmenere we were getting 12 13 different wines from virtually the same plot it was just crazy more more tannin more acidity different types of fruit all these different styles and it was then going back into that 
uh, that vineyard to understand what what was happening um, on this this tiny tiny little scale. So Rene was you know, was will we, we, be at the forefront of this because this is what he does, um, and it's about understanding with, with Carmenere and then how we evolve into something like the micro terroir Carmenere. Um, it sort of evolves out of this experiment, this three year experiment. But it, it's not just that experiment. It now becomes very much part of the the, the total way that Casa Silva makes make come here, make everything. It's that learning, it's understanding what, what is different, why it is different. Um, but on common air, it, the word micro terroir really means something. Um, it's terroir done on a tiny, tiny scale. And Rene will just talk a little bit about Los, Los Lingus and about the common air uh, and how we come to this sort of wine and why it is, why, why it wins a lot of awards, but why it's special to you, which is what we want to know. It's, it's the terroir, the silver, the Rene Vasquez, the Los Lingus terroir is what it's all absolutely, about. Rene, absolutely Rene Vasquez. Yeah, that's no more to say. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Johnny, you can keep a secret. But, uh, after, I won't tell anybody, you know me. I, no, I just don't, I zip, never say it's anything. A, it's just uh, for you you three guys, it's, it's a really super secret. Do you know Catador? I may have heard of it, yes. You know who is the best carmineri in Chile again? Oof, uh, uh, let me guess. Is it, uh, is it Conchi Toro? No. No. Uh, oh, um, really cold. Oh, it must be, must be one of the others then. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it can help you. <laughs> ah, it sounds yeah. like Casa Silva. <laughs> why, why is it Casa Silva, Michael Terroir? Let's try, was my message to a group of friends of <laughs> mine. Let's try. No, no, it's a, it's a secret. I, I, I know that is a few minutes ago, but it's a, it's a reality. This is the best Carmenere in town. Fantastic. But for, 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 for a number of years, it's been like that, but this is, this is hot off the press, everybody. So you, with me, with Frank, with Louise, we are the first to hear this in this country. So we are sworn to secrecy. Um, yeah, you received, Tony, did you receive the memo? The memo? Not yet, About no. The, the price of a uh, micro from today? It's it's quite it's ten times as much as it was yesterday. Exactly. Good. Maybe a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, Frank. Just for you. We, we still have it at the uh, beginner's price. Uh, for anyone who's interested, email events at averys .com. <laughs> So, uh, but just that we we we're lucky enough, Rene, here to have the 2012 yeah. Michael Terroir coming here. So, yeah, we'll tell us a little about bit about that. that. It's it's a uh, that was one of the things that I. I uh, I put on the table when 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 um, I was the, the, the I had sorry the opportunity to work here uh, was because for three or four years I tried to to buy some grapes from Los Lingues specifically Carmenere. Uh, when I uh, my first year I I discovered that Casa Silva has a lot of information, but, but a lot is uh, around 12 years of research uh, in the soil, uh, irrigation system, uh, canopy management, uh, kind of, uh, of uh, hormones and other things in order to improve the quality. But, and, and we use all that things with, uh, with Mario and uh, Pauline is 2019. Um, de Pauline, see. Si. Um, uh, when, when you collect all this information, the, we decide, okay, it's time to, to advance in the handlings in Carmenere. And uh, in, in a certain moment of, of those evolution, uh, we need to a final, to answer a final question is if we know about the soil, how many sand, clay you need, uh, whatever, uh, the time timing when you're leaping or not, shoot removal, uh, green harvest, or whatever. Uh, finally, we, we, we stopped with the one question. We have one clone, two clones, three clones, how many clones we have here? And in that moment, the, the, the Micro Terroir project changed in, in the way of uh, understand and discover how many clones we have in Los Lingues. 
we, we thought that is the, the reason why if we are in the same block, we have best carmineers here and not there. Um, for that, we, we earn um, uh, some money from the government and we use that in order to study the, the DNA of, uh, of uh, Carmineer. And we changed this, and this, the name of the second step was DNA, Magdara DNA project. For this thing, we, we work with the Max Planck Institute in Germany because they have all the devices. But the, the big surprise was uh, we started the, the project in, 2008, nine, with the DNA project. And um, we finished it, uh, it in uh, 2015. And the final answer to our question is, uh, do you have only two clones? Not four, not five or 10, two clones. The main issue here is when we say we have two clones, it's because we have the support of the DNA. At the beginning, we start with the phenotypic uh, idea: is that the shade of a uh, shape of uh, shade of uh, of the leaves, the, the kind of tips, the number of berries into the cluster, uh, whatever. But it's all the, that things are external. Today, we have we we have two clones. After that, we make a we make a nursery, and we planted both clones in Lolol and in Los Linges. That was uh, two years ago. The next uh, vintage, we have the first commercial uh, yield. Uh, commercial in the sense of uh, uh, we can make a a, a tank of a carmenere because. Until today, all the things was uh, micro vinifications. You know, you have all the things controlled. Today, uh, we have some uh, some difference between them, and maybe in the next vintage, we have more information and can uh, uh, bring to you those in that information. And, and uh, Rene, just a question: Do you think that the, the different knowing this much is is useful? But again, it's it is. We, we, it is good to look from the outside, isn't it? It's nice to know what you have, but it is that that uh, the, the looking at the, the, the flavors, the aromas, the phenols. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that is what it's all about. I'm talking about just two, two characteristics of, yeah. of, of both uh, Carmenes. The One is the the harvest uh, date. The second is the gill. But uh, there are many other variables in order to, we can say that this is the best for Los Linges, mm. and the other is goes better in, a, in Lolol or areas similar to Lolol. That's our goal. That's the achieve that we, we want to obtain, you know, is to say, okay, this clone is for this place, for this kind of weather, the geos goes around X and Y, and that's it. And in Lolol, we are, we are trying to be more specific, more specific, and uh, struggling there the, 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 with the best clone. This is the, the third step, step that we want to make. This, we select the clone Rene number one, because you know that the clones are named Rene number one. Rene number two, Rene number three. Rene number two, but it's, it's just for us because the, the family, the Silva family don't know that. It's, just, just a detail. It's a detail. But but do, 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 Rene, just let's let's have a quick look at this wine here because I think what what you've just shown us is that we 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 will never know the number of variables that affect Carmenere and why. And we we've touched on yields. And I know that in the last fifteen years we found that parts of the vineyard, if we slightly increase the yield, it makes the better fruit because it's the natural balance of the vine and it's that ability not to be set in saying we have to reduce the yield, we have to raise the yield, we have to do this. It's 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 being sympathetic to that part of the vineyard, and that's totally changed my understanding of, of vitic viticulture. Was the it's you, you, it's you speak balanced. to the wines, you speak to the vines, and then this this particular the, what we have here the, with the micro terroir um, is this. You know, we talk about little plots and little blocks of vines. This is almost you know, part of a row of an individual vine that you that you have picked as a the the the, the, the grower and maker of the, the vines and the grapes. 
in, in working with Mario Gacy, the winemaker, um, and finding these tiny little plots and bringing them together. This little, when we talk about a patchwork, this is a patchwork done in a very tiny, tiny, tiny scale, um, in little almost 100 meter plots or, or less. Um, and so this wine we have here is a, is a blend. Um, but of these tiny, tiny little plots that with, with René, with Mario Gessi, um, and every year we learn a little bit. And um, ch have you got the wine? Should we have a little, sorry, a little official taste of the wine? Because it's important just to see what Carmenere um, is, uh, what, what, it, what it gives us, which is, was a little bit different. You know, Cabernet, boom, fruit, tannin, bang. Carmenere, we're just getting one glimpse to it here. But I think that you know, we, we, we look at the wine and it's, uh, you know, it's just, We've got the 2012 here, and I think we look at it, it's still quite a purpley pink color. So to look at it, it it's still quite youthful, even though it's eight years old. And that's, you know, we, we quite often talk about age and youth. And, you know, like me, I, I'm aging, but I'm not as old as I look. Um, but it's, you know, a wine will not always, uh, if, it, if it looks youthful, it can be 20 years old. If it looks as though it started to develop in a red wine, if it's got that orangey, brick red garnet appearance to it, it may still be a young wine. But this is a, a wine that's eight years old, but it has a youthful appearance. So it still has some time to develop. Um, we give it a little, a little swirl around and take it up to the nose. This is where you can let yourselves go with Carmenere. I have heard every word, every mm. single word used to describe Carmenere from smoke to licorice to leaf to gauloise. But I think that was because the person I was speaking to was, was maybe smoking a gauloise um, at the same time. But that, so that could have had an influence. Um, but it, it, it is everything. But the one thing you don't notice maybe quite so much is, is the, 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 the black currant, the, the dark fruits. Yes, it's there, ripe fruit in the background, but it's everything else. So you can really let yourself go. And uh, on this one here, the, the micro terroir, goodness. What is interesting, yeah. it's still very elegant on the nose. It's not bashing you around the face um, with all these sort of big clumsy fruits and aromas. It's it's giving you little nuances, little glimpse of that coffee, that spice, that liquor, that herb, that more herbal elements to it perhaps is, is quite a strong one. Um, but what is the, the idea of this sort of wine? I think 20 years ago, the belief in Chile that you, you want to make your best wine, you make it you make it your best wine. You extract more color, you extract more out, you make it more alcoholic, you give it more oak. And that is our best wine. We turn it all around now with Rene here doing the work that we don't even talk about. It's so secret, um, understanding what's going on in the vineyard. It's about the fruit that defines the quality, not the other way around. Um, obviously, if we, if we had the winemaker here, we'd be obviously saying totally the other way around. I'm saying this for Rene, obviously. Uh, but it is all about the fruit. That is what defines the quality of this wine. And it's about not making the wines big, heavy and clumsy. It's making them uh, very uh, concentrated, very complex balance, as uh, Rene keeps on saying, it's all about the balance and just the tastiness of the wine, um, how long that flavor lasts. So we give this, give this a quick taste. There's one, one really important thing. Eh? When we start many years ago, and I started to work in this industry many years, around 30 years ago, uh, all the people talk about the greenness of uh, Carmener. And uh, that was a, a really uh, like a bad thing. You need to cover the, the greenness or the uh, the pyrosense in, in, in Carmener. Years after, it's obviously Carmener has a big concentration of pyrosense. And one of the distinguished uh, or the main characteristics of, uh, of Carmener is that uh, hairball or green or green is when, when when you don't don't plant it in the right place with the right weather you you feel just uh, everything is green that was uh, the big fault that we we made when when we start to produce uh, carmen air we produce carmen air in everywhere close to the the ocean doesn't matter no, nobody is still the, the variety because everybody would think is uh or thought is the, the same thing uh, like hammer law and it's totally different. When, when, when we decide to produce uh, micro terroir, one of the, the things that family, the Silva's family said to us was, we want to preserve the main characteristic of Carmen Air. And when you drink micro terroir, you, it's mandatory the people who drink the wine immediately recognize the, recognize the, the, the variety Carmen Air. In this case, it's really important. We use a lot of micro plots in 
in Los Linges. Los Linges is a it, it's a vineyard who has uh, around 125 hectares. A half of those hectares, 60 hectares, are Carmenet. And from this big ocean, we make a again a zoom and decide to this microplots are from micro terroir. The second is uh, this plot goes to Altura. We 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 launch or, or release a new a new wine, a new carmenet named S7. Uh, and this goes for S7, this this lots are for Grand Terroir, and this is our result. Uh, today we have uh, around 60 hectares and maybe 150 microplots that we use for different things and has different handlings or managings or whatever. They are different. When you walk into the What's Sorry. unique for you is that whilst Chile is shrinking their Carmenere because it's too difficult, Casa Silva is, is, is increasing the Carmenere because yeah, absolutely. we absolutely. are willing to, to, to look at the work. And, you know, with, with this wine here, I hope when we open this wine, you'll drink a little bit tonight, a little bit tomorrow. If it all goes, maybe you have to get another one. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's about seeing how this wine evolves in the, in the glass, in the bottle. And we're, you know, we, I think when we taste it, we get classic Carmenere, quite soft tannins. Um, the, the key is the soft tannins and this lovely fresh acidity here. I, people always say, how long, will this, how long will this wine last? And I think 10 years more, maybe maybe more. It's beautiful now, um, but it has so much to go. And it's that, that is the backbone, the essence of this wine. And when we think about Carmenere, um, yes, it's, it'll, it'll live long, but we, we think about the food we're going to have it with. I'm going to go out and have a nice open barbecue here in the vineyard with some nice, nice lamb, maybe, um, if I can catch it. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. We need to think about where we're coming from. And I think, I think hopefully what Rene has shown you, what I, what I want to show you, what Frank wants me to show you, is that this is a little glimpse into one, one family, one viticulturist, Rene, here with a thousand little mini plots. Times that by a hundred families and more plots. And there's so much going, going on. So much, um, so much exciting uh, new developments here in Chile. Um, and this, uh, the micro terroir, because it's come from a respect of the land and wanting to understand the grapes more and more every time. I think that's why Casa will still keep on. We don't like to talk about medals and things um, and winning, having the best Carmen every year, um, but it's, it's a nice endorsement, but it's really what Rene and what the family think. It's their, it's their feeling, their emotion and, and, and passion is in this wine. If it does well, that's nice. Um, but if the wine is tasty and they think it's it's what reflects them, that is the ultimate goal, and that's what we try and do here. It's it's bringing these these are extreme wines. We've had this salty, firm, punchy Sauvignon Blanc, unlike anything else. This Carmenere, yeah, you know, we look at the price, we think, wow, it's going to be big, but it's it's quite elegant, it's delicate, but goodness me, it's long and complex and has all you know. If you want to keep it blind Carmenere tasting, bang, there it is. But two extremes from you know, these different estates, goodness me, we could do another 10 tastings and not even touch what we do, what we do here at Casa Silva. Um, but I know we have a slight time time pressure here, Frank. Afraid so, um, yes. But, uh, yeah, that's, 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 what, well, that's what we've done. We can go on a little bit, but uh, there's, there's, so much, there's so much information here and so much exciting work going on. Um, I've, I've got to just say that. We want, we want questions, so, we want so we'll do it. So so amazing and a huge amount of knowledge there from both of you that, Yeah, to learn so much about Carmen, yeah, which is a great variety that does get massively misunderstood in the UK. And really? yeah, as soon as people taste the micro terroir, I think they're instantly converted. Mm. They can see the quality and the potential that is there. And it's such a fantastic, fantastic wine. Both of them are absolutely delicious. I've got to say an absolute massive thank you for, for both of you for, for joining us uh, this evening, for taking part and sharing your, your level of knowledge and expertise with, with all of us, uh, the, the staff that are on and the customers alike. I think every time we, we uh, listen to you guys, we just learn more, more and more and want to drink your wines more and more and more. <laughs> just, just yeah, enjoy that's it. That's perfect. Remember, remember, I have four tiles. Four tiles. They eat. They need to go to the university, the college. <laughs> Please. 
We'll do our best to help with that, certainly. <laughs> yeah. I think, <laughs> I think your passion and lead definitely showed through. I've never seen somebody speak with so much passion about the kind of the intricacies of, of viticulture so much. So for those of you that are joining that aren't WSET students yet, I think uh, you've uh, definitely probably encouraged some people to learn more about, you know, every aspect of the side of, of making wine, not just what's in the glass. But, you know, that was a really, really good overall picture of, of everything from, from the very beginning. So thank you very much. Good. And keep any questions that come in after us, send them through, and we will do what we can. We'll make yeah, it one, last, one, last, John, one last idea. One last idea, please. There's a, a, a total mistake to think in, in Carmener Kent age. This is at uh, 2012, and it has maybe 10 years more, and we are in the 20. When we taste the, uh, when we made a vertical of a uh, uh, micro terroir, we taste the uh, 2002, the first steps, 2005, and when you watch the color, see the color, and the 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 punch that the, this wines this wine has is is really impressive because all the people say, oh no, Carmenere is just for uh, make blends. It's not for uh, uh, for make a, 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 a single variety. It's a total mistake. It helps. It helps in the blend because it's soft, it's uh, fruity, but uh, Carmenere can age. Depends on the pH and the acidity and the, 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 the point in, in the curve when you decide to pick up the grapes and the way that you uh, make the wine. If, if you respect in, in all the, the steps, the, the same idea, the result is this. Good acidity, deep, uh, wide in the mid palate. Normally, all the carbonates goes down in the mid palate. This is like, a, for me, like a solid. It's uh, in the entrance of the mouth and in the end, you sal uh, you make a lot of, uh, it's juicy, it's long. It makes your mouth water. It makes your mouth water. But okay. what Rennie is trying to say here, yeah, very subtly, is that Carmenere... My, my, my English is like, it's really bad, but... Carmenere is aging better than me. That, that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm looking old, but the Carmenere is looking young. You say it every time, Rennie, I know. it. Just a different way, every time. Again, it's easy to see why it is always one of our best sellers at our big events. The, the structure and complexity of the wine, and yes, you could age that for, for many, many years, but I know anyone who purchases it tends to drink it straight away and then come back for more, which is also good.